All right, well, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you all for attending in person and online today. Uh, today we are uh, presenting our program, Completing the Mission, Supporting Veterans and Military Families. The sponsor of today's event is the Veterans Benefit Guide, and we'd like to thank them for our, their support. We are here today, just days after Veterans Day, when the country comes together to honor the 18 million veterans living in the United States. Caring for their health and well-being should be a year-round priority, so we are very excited to gather everyone for a wide-ranging discussion on veterans' health, both physical and mental, and how best to serve veterans, their families, after they have served the country. As with all of our Hill events, we have invited a wide spectrum of veteran services organizations and active duty military personnel. Unfortunately, not all were able to join us on stage today. Before we get underway, we have a few housekeeping rules. If you are here in the room, please put your phones on silent for the duration of the program, but you are welcome to join us on social media. And with that, I am delighted to welcome Mike Vicara, News Nation's Washington Bureau Chief, to the stage. He will be moderating our first interview with Allison Jaslow, CEO of the Iraq and Afghanistan's Veterans of America. Thank you all for joining us. So Allison is uh, Jaslow is maybe a familiar face to many of many of us. I know she's a familiar face to me because she's a, a strong advocate for veterans uh, as the head of the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. We were just talking backstage, and Allison, you were saying this is um, this is a unique time to be in your position. Yeah, I think that one of the most exciting things about stepping into this role, I became CEO in March of this year, is <clears throat> the post 9 11 generation of veterans are really ascendant in America today. Um, I am an Iraq War veteran. Um, the membership that I represent has all served post 9 11, and we are now mid career, so we're not just pop you know, popping up on Congress, uh, you know, the Mike Gallagher's of the world and the Pat Ryan's of the world who are getting elected to Congress, but also selling off their first startups. Um, and I think at a time where America's really thirsting for um, real leadership, our generation of veterans are stepping into places where they can really provide that. And so that excites me because mm -hmm. I feel like it, it also gives me optimism for our country and our future right now. So you're saying the post 9-11 generation is now sort of coming into their own as leaders of, leaders of society, leaders of politics, leaders of culture, yep. leaders of business. 100%. Yeah. Yep. And what, what do you do to help them along? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, somebody in my position, um, and especially like our founder, spent a lot of their time illuminating problems or needs of our generation, right. making sure that the post-9-11 uh, generation got the same GI Bill that the World War II um, generation of veterans got, or to make sure that we got access to mental health care, to make sure that People knew that there was a veteran suicide crisis, which still exists today. But on the same, uh, you know, at the same time, we also have um, tried to champion the Vets Rising movement, which is essentially also illuminating not just the problems that our generation faces, but also the opportunity that our generation of, of veterans brings for America at large. Um, you know, there are people who have stepped up post 9-11 and volunteered. We did not have a draft during our wars mm -hmm. to serve, served multiple times. M many veterans, myself included, um, deployed not just once, but twice or three times, um, especially the special operators these days. And I think that they represent the best among us. And so what we try to do is in addition to highlighting the challenges that face our generation of veterans is also highlighting uh, the best among us and also those people who, um, those Americans among us right. who are also veterans who can lead us forward at you know, what I would argue is such an important time in our country and the globe. Give me a specific example, if you could, about how the priorities are different now for this generation than, than in past generations. You know, I think multiple deployments ah. have caused unique issues. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak to mental health care you oftentimes see the veteran suicide crisis through the lens of PTSD or trauma experienced during wartime. <clears throat> but I have battle buddies, and I'm sure plenty of other folks do, who, because of multiple deployments, um, 
had a divorce or had a family fall apart because they were over it. They didn't want to have to say goodbye again. Oh. And I actually had a battle buddy who uh, deployed for his third time. His wife left him when he was in Afghanistan, and he took his life because, it, you know, mm. it, he was already struggling, and that was one thing too much for him. Um, and so I think that there are these unique burdens that folks who have deployed multiple times because we've decided to go to to war with an all-volunteer force, and people have deployed multiple times, um, where you know, your chronic pain maybe could have been avoided if you only deployed once, but because you deployed twice is very different. And then we're still learning um, more about sort of the unique challenges of the way that we're waging wars today. Mm -hmm. um, I'd recommend Dave Phillips of the New York Times wrote a really great inve investigative piece a couple of weeks ago about how um, soldiers who have been deployed, because if you didn't know, there are still troops in Syria and Iraq, um, in addition to those who've been prepositioned we, around. We've heard about that recently. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but they, to fight terrorism, and ISIS specifically, there have been artillery batteries who were deployed to the region, who <clears throat> we decided as a country to fight terrorism by just like bombing the crap out of ISIS. and the artillery troops who were doing the bombing, um, it seems like have uh, dealt with traumatic brain injuries that aren't being properly diagnosed because usually we figure um, traumatic brain injuries are a result of an attack from a combatant. But it seems like the artillery in this case, especially because they've, they've had more exposure to the actual firing than they otherwise would in a different combat environment, might have actually caused the traumatic brain injuries. And so there are these, like, just because of the unique way that we've waged war, whether it was in Iraq and Afghanistan or even in the present day, that like the all volunteer troops um, who are waging our current wars are just dealing with unique challenges that are very different than you know, the Vietnam and World War II. And part of that is also just generational. You know? uh, that's, that's so fascinating. So how does that translate to your priorities, as a your organization's priorities and your priorities as the leader of that organization uh, both here in Washington and elsewhere? Well, I think our priorities, more than anything else, are set by our leadership, and it's having a good finger on the pulse of what veterans' needs are and or desires. I mean, <clears throat> our generation has also lived through the opioid crisis, and so more than any of the other generations are we open to alternative therapies, whether that's... Um, you know, wanting access to, to cannabis to help manage your PTSD or with greater research around psychedelics, um, with psychedelic assisted therapy actually helping people heal from their PTSD, there are many veterans of at least the post 9-11 generation who want access, want more options on the table to help, you know, treat their wartime wounds. Um, but I feel like our role, especially as an organization that represents um, the current generation of war veterans, um, is, is twofold, not only just making sure that we keep the finger on the pulse of um, our generation's needs in real time, but we also are in a unique position to make sure that the voices of those who are still serving um, aren't overlooked as well. And I feel like the role that we play in that regard is I have the luxury to take to social media if I want to. Mm -hmm. You don't really get rewarded if you're in the military by like speaking up, <laughs> um, especially if you want to stay in for a career, which I thought I wanted to at a certain point. And so making sure that the needs and concerns of those who are still serving are attended to, and that you know, no politician is just speaking for them or no other group, but that actual you know, individuals who have served and no people who are still serving are making sure that those voices are heard is a, an important priority for us as well. Okay, you, you, your organization is, insist, is, is talking about insisting on a positive veteran narrative as one of its goals. What, what does that mean to you? Well, I mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, I think as much as we wanna address the suicide crisis, we wanna talk about the best among us. Right. Um, there are incredible veteran leaders, whether it's you know, folks in Congress like Tammy Duckworth or Mark Kelly or Mike Gallagher or Brian Mast. Um, there are also veterans who are serving on Wall Street and leading banks or senior executives um, or starting clean energy companies like John Powers is. Um, he lives in Buffalo, New York, so he's not here in Washington, D.C., but has spent some time in the Pentagon. Uh, but I really believe you know, it's, it's sad for me that, um, 
you know, there was a Time Magazine cover about a decade ago that called us the new, new greatest generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. <clears throat> yes, and while flattering, I feel like it's a false comparison because I believe that in World War II, it was actually a generation that stepped up to the right. plate post us getting attacked in Pearl Harbor. Whereas, you know, with our generation, it was a very small, you know, less than 1% of us who actually stepped up to the plate and served. And while I appreciate, you know, characterizing us as the new generation, or the new greatest generation, um, I actually don't think it was generational, but I also at the same time hope that our generation of veterans can maybe inspire other folks to step up, at least at this point, even if we didn't post 9-11, at a time where I think most people in this audience can agree that like we are really thirsting for leadership, we are thirsting for people who are putting country before themselves, that maybe our generation, or at least the best among us, can inspire other people to do just that. Okay, so you brought up the 1%, only 1%, fewer than 1% are serving in the military of American mm -hmm. citizens. So th this has been a big issue, a recurring issue over the course of the last year or so. And that is the recruitment challenges that the military faces. Yes. We, we hear that um, potential recruits don't meet physical standards or academic standards, or there's a lack of, lack of interest, lack of people going and, and signing up or wanting to sign up. Mm -hmm. What's the remedy? I definitely don't have all the answers, Mike. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but I will say, uh, first and foremost, I think we need to double down on how we take care of our veterans. Because if we want people to step up and volunteer to serve and to take that oath, they need to know that like <clears throat> what they're risking, what they're asking their family to sacrifice for, that despite all of that, despite what happens to them when they might deploy into combat one day, that their nation at least is going to take care of them full stop on the other side of that service, I think is very important. If they don't know that and have that guarantee going in, why would you step up and serve? Yeah. Um, but I, you know, more than anything else, and I've actually talked to leaders at the Pentagon about this, like, I wish we could make service, like, hip again, you know? All like, right. I, you know, I don't, I... When, I, when was it hip? Uh, I mean, has anybody in here seen the uh, movie Renaissance Man with Danny DeVito? <laughs> that was, I, like, I loved that movie when I was growing up. And right. I, you know, when I was growing up, the Army was the dream. I ended up getting out. But I think... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't feel like it's rocket scientists. I think mm -hmm. that, uh, rocket science, excuse me, I think that the cultural zeitgeist in America drives a lot, uh -huh. you know? And if we saw more movies or more people serving, and, and you know, in, in the context of what you do, Mike, like if we appreciated people's service and shed light on it, you know? Um, <clears throat> you know, unfortunately, I don't even think that the news is covering those who are serving as much as they should these days. Mm -hmm. How many people know that five special operators died over the weekend? In this room, probably a lot. Yeah. Maybe in this room. Yeah. Um, but I was talking to somebody earlier today who was like, oh, I missed that. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't always just want to shed light on those who are sacrificing and paying the ultimate sacrifice. But at the same time, no different than my organization is trying to shed light on both the problems but also the successes of our generation. Sure. I wish that... America and American society was also highlighting the successes. And that's successes. part of the, the positive veteran narrative, right, that, that you're talking about. Yeah, okay. you, you can join the military and, and level up your entire family. There you go. You know, you can serve and get the, the, the post-9-11 GI Bill is, I, I mean, if you want to go to Columbia that has a really great veterans program, you not only get tuition to Columbia, but the United States will pay for your um, housing at a, at a rate that allows you to live in Manhattan wow. without feeling the pressure of living in Manhattan. Okay. It, is a, it is a high, what they call it basic allowance for housing that mm -hmm. you get in Manhattan to go to school at Columbia. Um, and the fact that you, know, you can be rewarded by your country for your service and have, have come from a rural or inner city um, community maybe not having any of your parents who have gone to college spend a few years in the military, who knows if you deployed or not, but get out and go to Columbia University, no strings attached, right. that is a, that's like a rocket ship into, you know, what I hope would still be the American dream that you can achieve in this so country today. I'm, I'm hearing you say the part of the formula 
is reverence for service mm -hmm. and, re and veterans and re uh, reward for service. So it's- Of course. Yeah. But, all right. Sounds like a simple formula. Yeah. I mean, as long as we still continue to fight our wars with an all volunteer force, I think the, the benefits of serving outweigh the costs in many ways. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like, there, there is not risk, or is not without risk. Um, you know, I joined in a peacetime army and had no idea that the World Trade Center was mm -hmm. going to get attacked. I had no idea that we were going to go to war in Afghanistan. I had no idea that we were going to go to war in Iraq. Um, <clears throat> but that said, like, you know, anybody else who was in my same shoes and was mm -hmm. able to serve got really rewarded on the other side of that. You know, I went to school on an ROTC scholarship, so I didn't qualify for the post-9-11 GI Bill, but, you know, I think that it, it still comes, again, as long as we're going to still serve with our all-volunteer force, like, the benefits on the other side of your sure. service, if you're willing to step up and do it, um, in my view, outweigh the costs. And you get the ancillary benefit of wearing the nation's uniform, and serving alongside people who are fighting for a common mission. Um, and that is something that I feel like every veteran uh, holds near and dear to their heart. And they're, they're very different on the other side of their service than from you know, when they sure. stepped up and served, whether right. they actually deployed or not. At this point, I'm obligated, mostly because it makes me feel good to point out that my father joined the Marines before the Korean War broke out, re-upped, and then the Korean War broke out. So he ended up sleeping on a snowy ground in Korea for a long time. Um, what's but you, which you talk about generational yeah. divides, I can't even relate to that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was uh, compared to the World War II in Korea, we were pampered in Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay. So. <laughs> if you say so. Yes. <laughs> um, female veterans. What yes. specifically needs to be done for female veterans now that isn't being done? Well, I think more than anything else, um, and what's inspired a lot of my advocacy personally, is um, cultural recognition of women veterans. Um, I give a lot of credit to the board of the organization that I run now for elevating a woman veteran to lead Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, um, because I think to change the way that America sees its veterans, they just need to see me. <laughs> So, you know, when you close your eyes and you think of a veteran, you can most readily envision me as much as you would, um, I don't know, a gentleman who's in his 60s and wearing a hat, you know, like the VFW and Legion have. Um, and so, <clears throat> more than anything else, um, envisioning somebody like me and I making see. sure that there's recognition across the country for women veterans I think is most important because I don't want other women veterans to have to do what I've had to do myself, which is prove that I served. You know? Sure. Mike, if you told somebody you served, whether you haven't or not, they would believe you. Yeah. I'm the kind of person, like, because I'm a woman, I oftentimes have to repeat myself and or show proof that I actually is served. Right? Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's this sort of built-in Bias, Bias yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I think the reason I bring this up is that I feel like everything else comes after that. You know, we can get women everything they need if at a basic level we believe that they're veterans. Uh -huh. Because as a nation, we want to give veterans everything to support them on the other side of their service, right? But women veterans wouldn't have challenges getting their basic needs met if from a basic level we were believed to be veterans to begin with. Great. All right, I'm getting the uh, high sign that it's time okay. is up. That 18 minutes just it flew went right by. Away. Yeah. I know. Well, thanks so it's much like for being here. It's like we're having coffee here. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Sorry, yeah. I went off script a little bit. I appreciate it's all good. it. Yeah.